there's something about the Persian Empire which creates a situation that we as Americans can appreciate. But it's difficult for us sometimes to think back, could this have happened in antiquity? But it did. The Persian Empire extended from India to Egypt. I mean, Cyrus the Great ruled over Persia, Babylonia, Syria, everything from Iran to the Mediterranean Sea, and then India as well, at least that part of India, which is today Pakistan, and Kashmir, and so on. His son, Cambyses, then conquered Egypt in 522. So the Persian Empire extends from India to Ethiopia, the southern parts of Egypt. You'll find that expression many times in the Book of Esther. Every time it mentions the extent of the empire or it mentions a decree which was published to all the provinces of the empire from India to Ethiopia. It is also apparent that there were Jewish communities established in the Persian Empire in 127 different urban centers. The word used in the Megillah is uh, Medinot, and we use the word Medina today in modern Hebrew as a state, but that's not what it meant then because according to the Persian documents, there are 30 uh, gubernatorial regions in the empire called in Persian the Hashdarpani, and in Greek Satrapi. Uh, the Greek word, the Persian Satrap, means the governor, Persian governor of a province. There were 30 provinces in the Persian Empire. The Megillah of Esther says 127. And therefore, I say Medinot in that document should be understood as urban centers. So now we have the picture that in the Persian Empire in 450 BC, there were 127 urban centers throughout the empire where Jewish communities existed. Where did these communities exist? Any place from India through Persia, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, all the way across to uh, the Greek provinces of the Aegean Sea, and uh, Assyria, Israel, down to Egypt, and to southern Egypt, a thousand miles south of Cairo, on the island of Elephantine, where the Jews constituted a uh, division of the Persian army. How do we know that? because the discoveries on the island of Elephantine have revealed a Jewish temple and 450 letters written in Hebrew and Jewish Aramaic which refer to the events the, of the time. And these letters refer to the fact that the Jews in Elephantine, which is by the way at the place where the Aswan Dam is now, about a thousand miles south of Cairo, the Jews there served in the uh, garrison or the army of the Persian Empire to preserve that particular area from invasion from the south. Now, why were there so many urban centers? Because, and this we know not only from uh, the Esther book, but we know it from Herodotus, the Greek historian who describes the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was one political unit, and it was one political unit where people had freedom of movement. You can go wherever you want, no one will stop you. Not only that, as Herodotus explains, the roads throughout the empire were patrolled for safety. The communications in the empire were as excellent and as rapid as possible. They, by the way, had the original Pony Express, which is described by Herodotus in detail, so that royal mail never stopped moving. If they sent a letter from Babylon, if they sent a letter from Babylon to uh, Hamadan, which was the northern capital, um, that letter in a bag never stopped moving. What, what stopped was the rider and the horse. So the rider and the horse would take the bags and run from one station to the next, probably six or eight hours. Then the rider and the horse would get off and rest, and the bags would go on to the next horse, and the rider kept moving. So the Pony Express was established by the Persians, and Herodotus very poetically says, and these couriers Neither wind, nor rain, nor sleet, nor gloom of night would hinder these uh, couriers from the completion of their rounds. I mean, that's the beautiful uh, description of uh, the uh, efficient mail, which is, by the way, carved on the 
New York and the post office in New York. <laughs> that quotation from Herodotus. By the way, that Pony Express is mentioned in the Book of Esther several times. Because every time the, they issue a decree, they say, Vaharatsim Yatsu. The runners ran. They took the message and they started distributing it over the empire. It was a very well organized empire. And the proof of it is, I don't have to get literal proof, I can just get historical proof. The Persian Empire flourished for 200 years over an area larger than continental United States. I mean, from India to Ethiopia and from the Black Sea to the Southern Arabia is well over 4 million square miles, much larger than continental United States, and this flourished for 200 years. With these humane policies, freedom of religion, freedom of language, recognition of everybody's culture, this was policy of the Persians. And then, of course, they, they exerted their strength, and there were no rivals. And the only problem they had was with the Greeks at the far western end and then the two Persian Wars, the Greeks in 490 and in 480 BC. The Greeks won their battles, and they became uh, independent, at least in mainland Greece, although Western Asia Minor still had a large Greek population, which was part of the Persian Empire. But if you look at the map, when the Greeks became independent, it was like, this little piece is cut off. OK, the rest of the empire is still there. But um, so of the 20 or 30 nations in the empire, there seemed to be harmony. And we know that the Jews were always loyal to the Persian emperors. And the Phoenicians, who had the biggest fleet in the world, were loyal allies of the Persians. Namely, they were a part of the Persian Empire. And they were the fleet that fought the Greeks in the, these two battles. The Greeks happened to defeat them. Now, these, four, these 127 urban centers, 127 locations of Jews all over the Persian Empire, that is a diaspora. The Jews are a nation, and by the way, governed by Jewish law. And therefore, they have one legal system which governs the Jewish people. And they are bound together by a cultural unity. So while the Jews are speaking Persian and uh, Aramaic and Babylonian and uh, Arabic and whatever other language they are, are speaking, they're always they always have Hebrew as part of their cultural heritage, which they are able to read and to write and to speak also. And that is uh, another fascinating feature of Jewish history in general, that from the beginning to the present day, Hebrew has always been a living language. This nonsense that the Hebrew was dead and was revived in the 19th century is not true. It was always a living language. What Eliezer ben Yehuda did in the 20th century when he wanted to make Hebrew the spoken language of Israel, is to revive it as a spoken modern language in the 20th century. Because when you read documents written in the medieval period, it is a living language. It's not, just, it's not devoted just to rabbinical decrees and to religious laws. 